Okay. So uh, on behalf of the Three Rivers chapter, thanks everyone for, uh, for attending. Um, this is the first of an eight series talk on Agile MBSE and various topics in that domain. Uh, and it's gonna be given by Dr. Bruce uh, Douglas. Who, um, who has esteemed written many books. I have his books. So we've, we've really been working a, a while behind the scenes to try to get uh, Bruce to come and, and organize this, uh, this Lunch and Learn. So um, uh, we have a couple of introduction slides just on what Encozy is. I'm gonna talk a little bit about what uh, the series is gonna look like. We're gonna send out a survey at the end of uh, every one of these talks, ask you guys what you were interested in, if you liked it. We might pivot, uh, you know, at the end and, and bump off the last two talks and bring in some other some other talks if the if the interest of the forum goes a, goes a different direction. What we're proposing. So, um, thank you all for coming on behalf of uh, the the Three Rivers chapter and the other chapters in the in the region that I'll talk about in a minute. And we also want to thank our sponsor for the first couple of these, which is which is Smith and Nephew Robotics. So. This is um, what the series is looking like. It, it's sponsored by the, the Three Rivers chapter, the Heartland chapter, the Michigan chapter, the Wright Brothers chapter, and the Canada chapter. So we all pulled our membership dollars that come from you together to be able to, uh, to offer this. So we're going with kind of themed uh, months. So September, October is gonna be agile modeling. Um, October, November will be use cases and requirements. November, December is going to be ICDs and handoffs, and then January and February will be testing and uh, and MBSE patterns. So this is uh, this is what we're looking like for the for the series. Again, we're going to send a survey out at the end of every uh, at the end of every talk. Tell us what you thought. Tell us what you're interested in going next, and we might pivot uh, halfway through. We do have the first talk nailed down, which is today, and we also have the next one, which will be in two weeks, so October sixth. We're looking at sticking to a two-week cadence. So that'll be another thing we'll ask about in the survey is, is that too close? You want it spaced out a little bit more? Let us know and we'll, we'll respond appropriately. So what's in COSY? Uh, you know, looking from the, the, the registrants, a lot of people aren't familiar, aren't members. And is the International Council on Systems Engineering. We're a not-for-profit organization of volunteers that are really out, out there to, you know, improve the system engineering knowledge and you know, push out systems thinking. Um, it's an international organization, 1,800 members, 74 uh, chapters, 35 countries, and 55 different working groups. And I'll show an example of some of the working groups, but broad spectrum from requirements to MBSE to Agile, to a lot of the fundamentals in, uh, in, in systems engineering. So everybody here who worked to get this together, pretty much from a not-for-profit, uh, not-for-profit volunteers, and we're really trying to respond to what you need and what your interests are. So again, fill out the survey and, uh, and let us know. We'll get in additional talks and we're continuously lining up speakers and things. If you wanna know more about Encozy, go to encozy.org, check out the chapters. This is the, you know, the, the Great Lakes region is really the region that's putting on this, this event today, but there's other regions that might be in your area. And you may wanna get interested. We have lots of different events going on uh, all the time. Um, this just shows a map. So there's three there's three sectors of Nkosi, and we're we're out of the Americas region. Um, this is the Great Lakes region, so we're made up of uh, of various chapters um, that shows the location. Canada Canada chapter really has uh, has condensed into one. And with um, you know with COVID and and the the progression of the pandemic, one of the advantages has been actually that uh, that we can do more virtual meetings like this. So. We've kind of gone to a regional model where we where we have combined talks and we can get speakers that we wouldn't normally be able to bring. Um, this just gives you an idea of some of the corporate advisory boards that we have on here. So General Motors, Ford, uh, Boeing, uh, Idaho National Laboratory. So we have a lot of corporate sponsors. So, uh, you know, this is going to be on the slides. If you download the slides, check it out. See if um, your organization one of the CAB members, and you can get access to all the Encozy content on the website for, for, for free. All you got to do is uh, log on. This is some of the working groups that uh, we have. So you have 55 different uh, working groups. And, you know, there's, there's agile systems, engineering, complex systems, configuration management, human integration, smart cities, 
social systems, training, transportation, so a broad spectrum of working groups that are generating content, practices, best practices, style guides, procedures, lots of good content here to, to leverage and to help you solve whatever, whatever problem you're trying to solve. Um, so to, to learn more, visit encosi.org. Uh, in As always, we're looking for people to help. Uh, volunteer organization can never have too many volunteers. We're looking for people to help organize meetings, run down talkers for us. Um, and we're also looking for co corporate sponsorship to help you know, bring more talks and, and more content like, uh, like what we have here. So without uh, further ado, uh, let me introduce uh, Dr. Bruce Powell Douglas. He has deep and broad ex expertise from over 40 years of experience, specializing in both model-based systems engineering and model-driven development, embedded software and safety critical systems. He's developed systems in a number of subject domains, including aerospace, defense, medical, automotive, and telecommunications. He's a co-author of the UML and Syscall Standards and is the author of over 7,000 book pages from a number of technical books, including Agile Model-Based Systems Engineering Cookbook, um, the Agile Systems Engineering, the Harmony AMBSE Design Book, Real-Time UML, Real-Time UML Workshop for Embedded Systems, Real-Time Design Patterns, Doing Hard Time, Agility Time, and Design Patterns for Embedded Systems in C. He's formerly Chief Evangelist at IBM, and currently the senior principal systems engineer at MITRE. So, um, Bruce, with that, the virtual floor is yours. Awesome, thank you, Dan. Uh, let me take control here. Okay. All right, I should be up, I see it on my screen. All right, so welcome everybody <clears throat> to this first in this, in this Lunch and Learn series. Uh, what I want to talk about today is an introduction to, you know, model-based engineering. What's a model? How do I know I've done a good job? What does a good model smell like? Um, so I've already had the introduction to me uh, from, from Dan. So I will skip over uh, this uh, introduction slide next. Um, fine. All right. We can skip over that and get to some of the series. So we saw this before uh, in a different form. The series... Um, that we're doing in this uh, Lunch and Learn. We're starting off introduction to modeling, but there are other topics which may be of, of interest to you. And as part of the uh, uh, course today, there will be a giveaway of um, autographed copy of one of my books, the, late, the latest book. Uh, the rules are you must be present to win. And at the end of the, the, uh, uh, of the session, uh, you, your name may be called. Uh, you have to acknowledge that or someone else be selected. That them's the rules. So with that, let's go ahead and, and get started and talk a bit about modeling. So this is where I really want to start. People talk about, well, I did this model in Visio, I did this model in PowerPoint. Well, let's talk about the difference between a, a drawing and a model. A drawing is a picture with uh, imagined or loosely uh, managed semantics and under and no underlying repository information. It's just a picture, a picture of something. Uh, and the notion is you do some sort of notional work here. I need something kind of sort of like that. And then you go somewhere else, some other tool environment to do the real work, whether it's, you know, Emacs or a VI for, for banging out code uh, or, your, your CAD or your, your system C for electronics, whatever it is you're doing. You go to some other environment to do the real engineering work or Excel or Word. Or something. Uh, and um, that's not what a model is. So first of all, <clears throat> model is always an abstraction. We'll talk about this on, on the next slide. Model is always an abstraction where we focus on some properties of interest and ignore other properties. So we, we always, there's always an abstraction because we subset the aspects or properties of the system under, of concern, and then we represent them with at different levels of precision necessary to achieve the objectives. And you might have many different models of the same thing if you have different sets of objectives. If I want to look at a model uh, around, you know, how much power can I get out of this engine? I only model the properties of the engine around that. 
around, you know, it's, it's uh, how many pistons it has, the, the force per piston, energy lost along the drivetrain, you know, things like that. I wouldn't model maybe how much it costs or maybe the size of the engine or its weight or its color. Those are properties of the real system, but it's not relevant to questions we're trying to ask about how much power can I put out. So models are always focused abstractions to uh, achieve some particular set of objectives. We capture models um, in, uh, in a more precise language than natural language. So natural language is wonderful. Uh, you can, um, it's good for, for, for writing poetry. It's very expressive. Uh, if you want to write a poem with a state machine, that's perhaps not the most natural language which you want to capture in a poem. Although I did give my wife a very nice state machine, executable state machine poem for her birthday, and she, she liked that very much. But it's not perhaps the most natural language for, for doing that kind of work. So we represent properties so we can perform you know, quantifiable, quantitative reasoning about systems. We use a precise language to, to do so. And key to modeling is that as we do this, we, we identify those elements and characterize those properties. That information, that metadata, is captured in an underlying repository, which diagrams then visualize some aspects of that for addressing specific questions around the properties of interest. Now, with drawing, the only way you can fundamentally uh, ascertain the goodness or the quality of a drawing is to look at it. You can inspect it. That's it. And so while that's good, I certainly recommend you look at stuff. Um, it, it's the weakest form of verification. The reason why we don't trust Joe, uh, uh, the Joe's code for the nuclear power plant, just because he says it's good, we test it. Right, and we, we maybe do formal analysis, formal mathematical analysis on it. So there are other means, and we'll talk about some of those uh, later in this talk. But there are other means for doing more rigorous verification than just looking at it and saying, yeah, it seems, seems okay. And if I need documentation, the kind of traditional approach to getting documentation of the system is to put a junior engineer in a corner uh, and have them pound away, kind of disconnected from the information. So there's an air gap. Um, from the actual engineering metadata. And when he's typing the documentation, there's this air gap. So there's opportunity for mistakes and uh, to creep in and, and for things to be omitted in an unintentionally. But with a, with a model, you can create a report uh, documentation from that uh, based on some sort of template typically where you have some tool that scans over the, the metadata and pulls out information of interest and puts it in that report and organizes it according to the template. And so it's generated from the repositories. It tends to be um, have fewer defects than the, the traditional approach, and it's far, far, far less work than replicating you know, all the information kind of manually by hand. So it is possible, just because you say, well, I'm, 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 I'm not drawing because I'm, I'm using Rhapsody. It is possible to use a powerful tool like Rhapsody or Cameo uh, to actually use it as a drawing tool. It is possible to circumvent uh, the, the normal ways of working, I recommend you don't do that. Uh, one of my, uh, my day job activities is to review models done in a variety of, of, of projects. I, as I'm working for MITRE. Uh, I'm a principal as well as senior principal agile systems engineer for, for MITRE. Uh, we're an FFRDC, so we, we advise the government on technology issues. That's kind of our, our role. And I end up using, looking at a lot of uh, models for, our, for different kinds of systems in Department of Defense and other domains uh, and identifying, well, you know, that's not really semantically valid what you're doing there and that is meaningless. So it is possible to kind of circumvent the normal um, semantic rules of the language, even though you're using any modeling tools. My recommendation is don't do that. That's just a bad idea. So what is a model exactly? A model is an abstraction, a set of inter interconnected system data around a system of interest and the properties relevant to some sort of sets of objectives that you might have for that, for that model. So some newbies will say, well, we did a model so we can ask any question whatsoever of that system. Uh, and that's not really true. You can only model, answer questions that uh, were in scope, that actually you've modeled that information and then you can do analysis for, or, or uh, assist in conclusions from that. So first of all, models have a scope and purpose. So the purpose is the set of objectives you meant to achieve in a model. And that really drives the scope, what's inside the model and what's considered to be outside the model. 
you know, is, is the cost of the engine in scope or not? Well, it depends on what the questions you're trying to ask. It's certainly a property of the engine, but it may not be of interest. And what you're concerned with is how much power can get out of this engine. It may be in scope, but it has to depend. You have, you have a set of, of objectives that should be explicitly stated in your model. Purpose of this model is bang, 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 these things. And that determines what's inside the model. So that's one way in which models are abstractions. The second way in which models are abstractions are that they have different levels of precision. You can think about precision as the degree of information with which things are represented. Now, the real world has infinite precision. Well, okay, go down to quantum, we can have that discussion. But if you're above quantum level, um, there's infinite precision of information. You don't need to represent something. So for example, if you're doing um, a C2 for uh, cruise missile defense of the homeland, so a project I'm currently involved in, and you want to you know, understand that you know, the JDOC talks at the Eastern Descent Center, which is part of NORAD, and we have you know, long range radars, and we also connect you to, uh, uh, to missile launchers, and we want to talk about communication. Well, you can talk about the logical information across that. You can talk about you know, the bit, how the bits go across the wire. You can talk about individual radios. You can talk about within a radio that's got a transmitter and receiver and different parts and knobs and buttons. And inside the receiver, you can talk about the transistor level. At some point, you stop because further level of detail doesn't help you achieve your objectives and, in fact, obscures it. So we always limit uh, to our, our level of precision in a model uh, to, to meet the objectives of the model. Now, around precision, we think of there's a term called accuracy, which is the conformance of a, of a, typically a value to a level of precision. So for scalar quantitative values, um, precision can be thought of number of significant digits. So I can talk about controlling the rudder of an aircraft. And I want to move the, the rudder to 15 degrees. Well, accuracy says, well, I said 15 degrees, and I represent that to maybe four degrees of precision. When I say I move it to 15 degrees, how close do I say that's good enough? Is it 14 and a half? Is it 14.9? Is it 14.999? You know, how close do we say that conforms to that value? That's what we call the accuracy. Fidelity is the precision of an input. So if I'm using a joystick to control that rudder, how closely can I specify I want 15 degrees? Because maybe I have this analog joystick and I might only be able to get within plus or minus a half degree. That's the fidelity. And all those things are relevant to what we model and how we model it. Good models are falsifiable. And the flip side of that is verifiability. So falsifiability comes from epistemology. Uh, models, well, statements are made that are of truth. So models make statements of truth, uh, either imperative declarative statements of truth. And falsifiability means if that statement of truth is in fact incorrect, there is some way to demonstrate that it's incorrect. That's what falsifiability means. If I do a model in which there's no way to verify the uh, truth, the veracity of the model, then I don't think it's a very useful model. In practice, it's not a very useful model. So good models identify means by which they may be verified or falsified, if you remember that term. The point of this, really, is that models are this interconnected data. That's the model. Oh, and by the way, Models have views. So many people, you know, UML and, and SysML you know, newcomers think, oh, it's all about the diagrams. Actually, that's not true. Uh, as one of the developers of both those standards, I can tell you that the perspective of the development team is it's all about the data. Oh, and by the way, secondarily, yeah, there are views, there are diagrams. They're really kind of almost, an, not, not quite, but almost an afterthought. As we visualize information, but the thing, representation of the information in precise ways, that's the point of the model. So as we have this model, we might have different views, you know, different diagrammatic views, vocabulary views, matrices, and, 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 and so on, which pull information out of that repository and render it visually for consumption by various kinds of stakeholders, whether they're technical or potentially non-technical stakeholders. So having said that, yes, there are diagrams, <clears throat> Diagrams always show a subset of the engineering data held within the model. 
and I, 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 I rail against the, uh, uh, the windmill here um, when it comes to what I call eye bleeding charts. It's really common in, in, in DOD to have these eye bleeding charts uh, where you put every possible detail in the entire model in one diagram. I remember visiting a, an aircraft company in Seattle, which I won't name, uh, where they had, uh, this is in the 80s, um, they had a, a rendering, a, a, a physical paper rendering of, of some aspect of their aircraft design. And it was on e size plotter paper, which is like two by three feet in size, using, I'd probably say a four point font. And these were taped together going 50 yards down the hall. And they had you know, thousands of elements on this, on this area. And they, they were so proud of it. Isn't this wonderful? And I said, no, that's useless. I mean, it looks like a good manager. She can say, oh, look, I got circles and arrows and everything. And I got lots of them. I've done, I've done work. But that's really not useful from an engineering perspective. So if, if that's not useful to put everything on there, how do you decide what goes on a diagram or not? So what I do is I say, every diagram should have a mission, a purpose in life, a singular concept that is trying to represent, or a singular question you're just trying to answer, or a singular line of reasoning that you want to support. There's some purpose in life. And to my mind, if you've got five different questions, you've got five different diagrams, at least, possibly more, but, but you have different diagrams for each question. And that, that leads you to diagrams which are readable and usable for their intended purpose. Um, and again, one of my, my day jobs, I review lots and lots of models. And models that have diagrams which are essentially unusable are usually either because there is no focused purpose of the diagram, it's just stuff what's in the model, or uh, it has multiple purposes. So this and this and this and this and this. And it's better if you got, you know, again, four questions, have four different diagrams. Diagrams are cheap. So to be clear, you do not model in Visio. You do not model in PowerPoint. You can do drawings in those tools. And hey, I like PowerPoint. We're using PowerPoint now. But it's not a modeling tool. You do not model in Visio. Not that I have an opinion. Um, so <clears throat> uses of diagrams. I mean, said there are diagrams. So what are these diagrams for? Well, there are three primary uses of diagrams. First of all, data entry. So if I'm, if I'm doing my, uh, my aircraft design, I start you know, identifying you know, structural elements like blocks or behavioral elements for a, for a structural element like a state machine, like states and transitions and signals and, and, and actions and so on. I enter those in diagrammatically. And the tools then take that and create information in the repository that represents that. And if I modify an element, it's modified in the repository. Now, if I have 15 different diagrams that render that particular property, they're all changed when I update the repository because they're dynamically linked. So data entry is one of the key things we do with diagrams. Model visualization. So sometimes you have a bunch of elements in your model and you say, I want to show how these work together, how, some, how, they, how they collaborate. So I create a new diagram because that's a new question. I have a mission for that. And I drag those elements from the, the containment tree or the, or the browser, um, different tools call it different things. And I say, you know, show me these properties uh, and these relationships uh, among those things. So I can visualize aspects of the model to answer specific questions. Another good use for, for diagrams. And lastly, uh, some tools allow you to do simulations less execution, debugging, execution control. And I can control those and visualize the dynamic behavior during execution. Uh, in those in such tools. So diagrammatic views is a way of visualizing. I can do a design by specifying the, the views diagrammatically and creating those elements. And then I can debug and execute it and run it and visualize that execution at exactly the same level of abstraction. And that's a really powerful notion or a verification of model, uh, not model correctness and model quality. So anybody who's read my stuff knows I am all about executable models. So there's this Douglas uh, paradox that any language rich enough to say something useful and interesting is also rich enough to say utter nonsense that looks at first glance reasonable. So how do you tell the difference? That's the Douglas paradox, right? You have one language rich enough to express what you want, but problem is you're now also rich enough to say just nonsense. So to address that, I believe in computable models. So a computable model is one where I can, well, basically do the math. It's formally defined. I can, with enough precision, I can do the math. 
an executable model is a kind of computable model where the, where the computation has a specific direction. First this, then this, then this, then this, and that's an execution as opposed to general kind of thermodynamically reversible computation. F equals MA given two values that can compute the third. So why do you do this? Because we want to verify the quality and correctness of our models. Models make declarative imper and, and, and imperative statements of truth. And by that, by declarative, I mean identify what you want to happen, but not really some exactly how it happens. And imperative, you say, okay, and this is how you do that. So I would argue that requirements are by and large declarative, and a state machine would be by and large imperative. Okay. So it's absolutely crucial, uh, particularly system. Remember, um, I should say, my perspective on engineering and modeling comes from the fact that I spent 40 years building high reliability safety critical systems, both the embedded software for those systems and the, the system and system engineering for those systems. And that colors my perspective on how to do things. Because if I get it wrong, it's not a matter of just rebooting and closing windows and reopening them, people die. And that does color my perspective. And if you're in a different environment, it might be okay to have a slightly different perspective. Ah, the user can just reboot their system, no, nobody cares. Okay, that might make sense in your in your context. If you're doing aircraft engines or CAT scanners or radiation treatment devices or missiles, uh, no, not so much, right? Because those have definitely safety impact. So that is absolutely crucial uh, from my perspective that we can demonstrate the veracity of the statements we make in our model. And execution is a key way we do it. We can also use formal methods. We'll talk about really briefly about that in just a second. And the more the larger the model is, the more important that is, because it's easier for defects to you know, creep through if, in bigger models. And the more significant the impact, the more critical that is. So we're absolutely magic draw, allowing you to build execute uh, models. I did get a comment from Sparks um, uh, last night. <laughs> so I added them to this thing and said, we do that too, we do that too. And I haven't uh, used Sparks in a, in a while. Uh, when I last time used Sparks, it didn't execute models, it didn't simulate them. Um, but now they, they claim to, I haven't seen it, but they, they claim to if so I put them in the here as well. So I want to talk about V and V and how it relates to, to, to models. So there are a couple things you can look at, uh, concepts that people apply. Um, some people will say that verification is about meeting the requirements and validation is about meeting the need. Okay, you know, I, I can accept that. Um, another way to think about it is that verification is about um, building the system right, and validation is about building the right system, which is kind of another way to say essentially the same thing. Yeah. Okay, that's fine. Uh, this slide is really about, it's a, what I call a brucism. Um, it, it's kind of the way I think about it. I think within verification, there are kind of two broad categories of verification. The first of these is what I call a syntactic verification or well formed, it's compliance informed. So um, it's a general rule. Every time you have a project that uses models, you should have modeling standards and modeling guidelines. If you want examples of that, you go to my website, boostdashdouglas.com. Um, and on the papers page, there are example modeling guidelines. Um, uh, and you can customize or tailor. And, and there are others out there. You, can, you don't have to use mine. Uh, but there are others out there. But they say, so you know, organize your models in this way. You should use these naming conventions. Uh, these are the typical uh, work products we expect, you know, diagram forms you expect to, to produce. You have to address these concerns, you know, for this kind of a model, those sorts of things. Uh, it's well formless. It doesn't mean that you're not making sense with those statements, but these statements are there. So it's compliance and form, not necessarily compliance and meaning. For process compliance, which is important for safety critical systems, you'll have audits where you generate evidence that you, know, you have this process which has previously been demonstrated to meet the safety objectives of the standard to which you must comply. And audits come in and provide the evidence that, yeah, we did that. We did what we said we were going to do. For work products like models and model views and model elements, we do a syntactic review where we look at it and say, and you can go through the checklist and say, so did you avoid line crossing? You have a comma in the upper left-hand corner of the, of the diagram that says, you know, the purpose of the diagram. Uh, did you follow the canonical model organization principles? You know, those, those sorts of things. Uh, is it well-formed, right? 
In some cases, you can automate this. Uh, in some cases, it's done by inspection. The other kind of verification is what I call semantic verification, our compliance and meaning. And this has to be done by uh, engineering personnel and subject matter experts. Uh, and there are three basic techniques. Uh, one is semantic review, where you have subject matter experts look at it. Okay, that's fine. Uh, and I certainly recommend that. And if you look at the Harmony process, of, of which I'm an author, uh, there are workflows in that that describe, you know, how do I uh, evaluate, effectively inspect a model uh, for correctness? How do I, how do I deal with? What, what are the steps involved, and how do I how do I run such a such a meeting, such a process? So okay, fine. So and that's good. However, it is the weakest means, and it's weak for a couple of reasons. One reason is that uh, some kinds of problems are just difficult to see visually, uh, but they're easier to detect by other means. Another problem is one of vigilance. Um, some of you have probably been on requirements reviews. And if you've got 15 requirements, meh, not so hard, right? Take you half an hour, you, you bang out questions and issues, and, and you're done. But what if you have, say, the Boeing 727, you have 200,000 requirements? What do you do in that case? And so after a while, vigilance lags and the quality with which you find um, uh, the problems you know, degrades over time. So the next step up is testing. A testing where you have a set of inputs with you know, uh, some particular set of values, sequence, and timing, and have a known and expected outcome or output. And you say, I expect in this case, this test case, I'll get this outcome or this output. And you have then a set of those, that's a suite that you apply. Um, this is much, much uh, higher level um, quality of verification, depth of verification than just looking at stuff. But um, is it, one, is expensive. Uh, it requires executability. It means you have to build executable, computable models. You don't apply this to models. Um, so with regard to expense, 60% um, of the cost of embedded systems is in testing them, not in their actual original development. So it's, it's expensive. And you can get increasing levels of coverage at increasing levels of cost. But it is impossible to fully verify because there's essentially an infinite combination of all the inputs, of all the different values, all the different sequencing, and all the different timings. So you're not going to test an infinite set. You have to cut the line somewhere and say, that's good enough at some level of coverage. Next step up from there is formal methods. And that's where you use typically languages like Z, predicate logic, temporal logic. And you can do things like theorem proving, reachability analysis, um, and other kinds of, of formal quantit uh, quantitative analysis. Uh, it does, uh, it's real, it is the strongest means. There are things that you can verify using formal methods that you cannot verify with testing. If I want to say, I can guarantee in this system with four elevators and 10 floors that you can always satisfy a request in three minutes or five, whatever the number is, five minutes, 10 minutes, whatever. Um, that's not something you can test. You might do a thousand test cases and never find the one edge case where that's not the case, where that doesn't happen. But you can do formal theorem proof, okay? It's really hard to do though. And, um, uh, it's also highly subject to invariant violation. So like Gerdell said, that every uh, internally consistent system relies on external invariants. Um, and for that reason, if you violate those invariants, you can't judge your conclusions. So if Susan is on you know, floor six of elevator four, holding the door open, and the elevator motor uh, for elevator uh, in, in shaft two is broken, you know, that invalidates perhaps your assumption of your, of your proof. But collectively, these are the techniques used to verify the correctness of your model. And lastly, we've got validity or uh, relevance, I guess, in the way to think about it, of your solution. Are you solving the right problem? And this becomes a problem because there's always an air gap between requirements and, and the system uh, uh, need uh, that is trying to do the system, the need the system is trying to, to address. Uh, the theory goes that if you build a system with these properties as required by the requirements, it will meet my need. But that's, that's really an air gap. Uh, Department of Defense did a study where they found 45% of the systems that they require cannot be used for original purpose because largely, not entirely, but largely because the, um, 
uh, requirements didn't really specify the need. Right. So having said that, <clears throat> there are ways that we can perform validation. Uh, commonly we review. So if all you can do is, is look at something, you've got drawings, then all you can do is review it. And again, that does add some value, but there's still issues with that. You can also do simulation even early on around some capability. So you're doing maybe a use case or a capability analysis uh, for a system and you build this executable requirements model, something I do all the time. And then you can do what if. What if the pilot does this, and the enemy does that, and the missile does this, and the ground system does that? And what about that case? Well, you can actually run that simulation of your requirements model and say, ah, well, this is what we specify will happen. The traditional way is just kind of thumb through this uh, page of thousands of requirements and try to find that. And that's you know, problematic, I would say. You can also execute in a sandbox. Uh, we have this constrained environment. You can do early flight tests uh, in some sort of operational environment demonstration of system capabilities. And you can also do deployment, even deployment sometimes of not completely capable systems, but to get a feel for how well they address the, the needs of the stakeholders. So there are approaches uh, for doing validation as well. So when I think about you know, verification validation of the quality, you know, falsifiability of my models, this is what I think about. So in COSI, uh, um, this is kind of a slide summarizing this, this um, document from Incozy, has a, has a organizational model-based capabilities matrix from level zero, where we have no model-based system engineering capability, to level one, we've got some limited use for and transfer specific questions or address specific needs, to, to a kind of standard uh, uh, way of using modeling for different things, to widespread use of modeling throughout your projects, to deployment as a standard approach with a reasonable set of digital engineering assets and platforms as the standard way of addressing uh, your, your engineering uh, programs. So there's different levels of maturity kind of at the organizational level. And that actually aligns pretty well with this maturity uh, model that I've had for, for a number of years for kind of project level uh, modeling maturity where you start off with silo document-based, text-based approaches, um, where you have, you have heroic efforts to deal with all the issues that come up with disconnected silo data that isn't precisely represented, to visualizations of engineering data, um, to standardized approaches for using modeling that employ things like the notion of single source of truth, uh, and use the use of modeling guidelines and standards and strong integration engineering process, the next step up is to build, you know, falsifiable executable models in that context, um, and use of, of quantitative metrics over uh, model quality and, and also as well as kind of program um, uh, metrics as well. Up to level four is where you know models are used as the core basis for all engineering work. This forms the core environment in which you'll you do your engineering work, um, and that's the, the most mature level. And, since, as I, and one of the things I do is I'm, I was brought into MITRE uh, from IBM uh, with a mandate to elevate the engineering capability of MITRE as an engineering organization with respect to digital engineering and models. Um, so that's kind of, <clears throat> I spent a lot of my time kind of focused on, on that. We're elevating the level of maturity of organizations and projects so they can get more value out of their modeling efforts. So in system model, the number of different modeling views, uh, we have functionality, and we'll talk about the, these pillars. So we have you know, use case diagrams, requirements diagram, requirements tables, requirements matrices, and so on. Um, we have things around structure, like uh, you know, in UML to be class diagrams, and system model to be block diagrams, to represent the type, type structures, um, and um, for how they connect in the real world, what I call the connected design or connected architectures, we use internal block diagrams or composite structure diagrams. For interactions, we use sequence diagrams or you know, my favorite uh, view, timing diagrams. Um, for flow-based behavior, uh, using token flow execution semantics, we have activity diagrams. For state-based behavior, we've got, of course, state diagrams based on heroic state charts. And for parametrics and quantitative computable models, we can use parametrics to represent the constraints with a limitation on values and how they connect uh, to build up computational models where we can evaluate uh, quantitative properties of systems. Uh, 
So SysML and UML, as I mentioned, I'm, I'm a contributor to both these standards. And SysML is based on, on UML. Uh, they're the subset that not everything in UML is in SysML. There's a subset. And that subset brought over is called uh, UML for SysML, formally in the standard. So there are these four pillars. So this is um, uh, was identified by Chris Cobran, who was the lead of the, um, uh, the UML for Systems Engineering, Engineering RFP effort originally, uh, and the, R, the uh, SysML Partners uh, effort. Um, so he kind of quoted this, and I've, I've changed a little bit because I don't exactly like how he did that, but it's, it's very close to what I have here. Uh, the first pillar, we'll talk about structural. Uh, one of the things, so in, in the early uh, 2000, late 1990s, I was doing system engineering with UML with a variety of, of customers, aerospace and defense customers primarily. Uh, but there was this kind of thing that, well, we can't use UML because UML has classes and we have blocks. So we changed the name of class to block and all of a sudden they said, oh, we can use it now. And it's a little bit more complex than that, but that's really basically true. So there are some things which are used as is, you know, packages, operations, you know, profiles, stereotypes, interfaces, and so on. And there are things that are renamed. They're just renamed. And there are things which are kind of new fundamental types. Um, in SysML, we, we uh, rename class to block, object to, to you know, instance part, uh, uh, instance specification. Uh, attribute became value property. We also added the notion of dimensions, which was later changed in you know, SysML 1.3 to uh, quantity kind. And units, so you know, meters, furlongs, pounds, ounces, lumens, units uh, of measure. Uh, and, and, and there's an optional uh, compliance point in the standard to include the ISO 80,000 library of international standard units. A class diagram became block definition diagram, composite structure diagram became control block diagram. Um, so what Chris referred to as requirements uh, pillar, I prefer to think of it as functionality. Uh, this is kind of declarative functionality uh, requirements. Use cases are used as is, use case diagrams as is, but we also added the notion um, to UML of requirement. Yes, I arguably think that requirement should be part of UML, but fine. Uh, when we started to work on, on SysML, it wasn't, so we added it in SysML. And we added some views around that. For behavioral imperative view, not all the diagrams made, made it, so communication diagrams made it, timing diagrams, unfortunately. And I kind of created those for UML2 and shepherded them through the approval process. And I was kind of sad, sad face, um, that they didn't make it into SysML. Because for me, in my world, timing and explicit representation of timing are really important for correctness. Uh, and it's not a really good way to view that in SysML. You can, you can kind of sort of get there, but it's, yeah, it's limited. Interaction overview diagram, nobody used, so that's fine. State diagram, activity diagram, sequence diagram used pretty much as is. Uh, activity diagram is extended. The big extension, the activity diagrams, is we added the notion of continuous behavior. Uh, normal activity diagrams execute via uh, token execution semantics. So when an uh, action is done, it, it sends a token to the next action or next set of actions in sequence. Uh, which means it's very much discrete because it's handed off at some point in time. So how would you model? So if I'm going to send to a, to, to a, a water heater, you know, set this as the end temperature, there's a discrete message, you know, set the temperature to, uh, to 90 degrees. You know, I can do this very discrete. What about the water flow from the water heater into a tub? How do I model water flow there? That's a continuous flow. And so we added some, some additional notions like uh, continuous behavior. We had a probability of firing, so we can do Markov chain analysis. And so there are some, some I think, relatively minor, minor extensions. And the last pillar is in parametrics, where we took the notion of a constraint, this limitation of values, of quantitative uh, values. And we added constraint blocks and parametric diagrams, carrying properties to, to kind of build up these computational arrays, connected arrays of, of constraints to do the math, essentially. Uh, a point I do want to make that really UML and SysML are the same language. Um, SysML is subsetted, and there are some extensions, but under the covers, um, it, it's UML in system engineering clothing. 
It's not so true when you in system L2, which is a little bit ways out. Uh, there's a the notion of architectural frameworks. Um, uh, these are frameworks is an encapsulation of practices, requirements, and representations for work products that capture system architecture. So you may be familiar with, with DODAF, it's been around for quite a while, or TOGAF. Um, and then UPDM and UAF are representations of, of, of DODAF, and UAF is kind of like version three of UPDM, uh, using UML as system actually the underpinning. Um, and there are other standards like DND, uh, DNDF for, for Canada, NAF or NATO architecture framework as well. So these, these, you can also think about these, which are at least conceptually derived from the Zachman framework where you have some sort of you know, area of information versus a domain of interest uh, matrix. And you have different views in the different areas of inside this matrix. And it's really explicit if you look at the uh, UAF spec. Let's talk a little bit about UML. Um, current version is 2.51. It was standardized, um, started the first release is 1995, was standardized in uh, 1997. That was version 1.1. And it's really uh, a modeling language for MDD, for model driven development of software. Um, supports, but doesn't require object oriented approach. It is process agnostic. So on intentionally, on purpose, we excluded the notion of process from UML. It's a basic language. And separately, you can define what process you might want to apply and using tools and languages like SPEM, the Systems and Software Process Engineering Meta Model, which is a separate standard from, from UML. It's a graphical language in which you express things diagrammatically, which then again, again gets entered into this underlying repository. Uh, packages or model elements used to organize your models. Uh, uh, it's just a, a package is a model element that contains other model elements, including other packages. Uh, and one of the kinds of things it can contain is diagrams so have different types. And within a type, like a, a block definition diagram, you're going to different intents or purposes or missions. I call that diagram usage. So the semantic basis is this four tier meta model hierarchy. So at M0 level, that's you know, the aircraft flying in the airspace. At the M1 level, that's the blueprints of the design of that aircraft. That's called the user model. Uh, at the M2 level, that's the definition of the language in which you capture those blueprints. That's UML or SysML. Uh, that's the meta model. And at, at M3, um, then you have the meta meta model, which is the language in which UML itself is defined. And if you ask us for more depth, then we change the subject. So it's, it's um, um, shown over on the right-hand side, you've got these you know, four, four levels and um, you see like meta turtles, uh, you're familiar with oh, maybe uh, <clears throat> Pratchett's uh, writings. Um, it's kind of like meta turtles all the way down. It's a way of organizing the models, which makes it a rigorous structure, but a kind of a complex structure to, to read and, and to grok uh, by reading the standard. There's a number of diagrammatic forms. Uh, most important here would be, you know, probably class diagram, uh, activity diagram, use case diagram, state machine, and sequence diagram. And the other ones certainly have value, but those are the kind of certainly the primary use. Then there's SysML, which is our, our primary concern as system engineers. So um, in a joint effort between the OMG, the object manager group, it's not, oh my God, it's the object manager group. Uh, in COSI and AB233, uh, we developed this uh, response to that RFP called System Model, Systems Modeling Language. And it supports specification, design, analysis, verification, and validation of systems which are not entirely software, right? They're, they may contain software, they don't have to. They may contain software. But mostly we're focused on doing system engineering, which is a specification of systems properties more or less without regard to whether they're software or electronics or mechanical or chemical or whatever aspects of it. The use of models for system engineering is called NBSE, model-based system engineering. But remember a couple of things. One is UML system model are really the same language under the covers, uh, minor naming difference, at least at the basic level. Uh, and that like UML, system L is process agnostic. Here's a, a kind of a history um, chart. 
uh, of, of UML, it's the first release of, uh, of UML, again, finally standardized in 1997. Uh, Peter and, and I released the Harmony uh, Engineering um, process, Harmony SE process, um, what was it, about 97, I guess. And we work with a number of companies uh, to use that process, to use UML for, for modeling. But again, people said, you know, we have issues, we've got classes here, we don't want classes, we want blocks, dang it. Um, we wrapped up work on UML 2.0 in 2001, and we began work on the SysML uh, standard uh, in 2001. 2003, we had the initial release of SysML for adoption, but in, your, in the OMG process, there's a finalization effort. That took three years. So 2006, we finally had the adopted standard of the SysML. Now, Sandy Friedenthal, who is uh, the lead, uh, technical lead for the uh, development of SysML, with Alan Moore and, and Rick Steiner, published this book, Practical Guide to SysML. Um, um, similar, about around the same time, I uh, took the Harmony process and adapted it to the use of SysML now and the use of uh, agile technologies, agile approaches into the process. And that's available on my website if that's of interest. And in 2017, um, I published my Agile System Engineering book. Uh, around that time, uh, work was started on SysML 2.0, which is a pretty uh, major overhaul of the language. Um, 2019, SysML uh, 1.6, which is the current standard, was released. And then earlier this year, I released uh, the latest book, latest book of um, recipes or, or workflows called the, the Agile Model-Based, Model-Based System Engineering uh, Cookbook. If you want to know more about the standard, if you're, if you're a little bit of a masochist and you want to read the actual standard, uh, there's a link here. You can go track that down. It's, it's kind of dense reading, frankly. There are nine diagrammatic views and a couple of, of kind of tabular forms. Uh, some of these are used directly as is from UML. Some of these are modified. So really it's not so much the diagrammatic form itself is modified, but the elements that they show are, have modified, they're renamed or modified in some ways. And those are the ones in blue and the ones in red are, are new, new forms. A requirements diagram, parametric diagram, which is a kind of internal block diagram, which again, a kind of structural composite diagram. Uh, allocation matrix and requirements table are our new views in, in, uh, in SysML. So this is kind of my, my take, uh, some of this my take, on, um, on SysML views. So we have the views with their abbreviations over on the left, and then the kind of view is static functionality, dynamic behavior, and so on. Uh, if there's a direct UML2 analog for it, where it might be used. So I think uh, the other column is the more interesting part. Uh, I think there are six kind of really essential views in what system engineers are doing today. Uh, use cases, so you have to reason about capabilities. I think that's really important. Uh, and then you have these uh, behavioral views, three behavioral views, activity sequence and state diagrams. Uh, to represent structure, you need to have two views. One shows the types, box R types, uh, and their properties, and how you build collaborations from them. And that's, that's on BDDs. And you need to be able to show the connected architecture, how they actually connect and running system, and that's shown on IBs or internal block diagrams. Three of views, these views are really essential for um, dynamic simulation and the behavioral views. And for just generic computational views, we have parametric diagrams. Code generation is not a critical feature for um, system engineering because the outcome of system engineering, I would argue, is specification, not implementation, at least kind of left side of the V, kind of, kind of the side of system engineering. Uh, but some of these views are involved in code, in code generation if, if you want to do that. And lastly, uh, on the right, right hand corner there, the edge, we've got more formal views. Some of these views like requirements diagrams, use case diagrams, are, are, um, they rely on some natural language and expressions. They're not really, they don't have deep formal semantics. Other things do have more deep formal semantics. As these are identifying the ones which have those formal semantics.
Um, <clears throat> so as part of the uh, work I'm doing with, with MITRE and others, I created this curriculum. Uh, each one of these boxes represents a course, and each course, these are all three-day courses. So the addition that you can, the idea that you can learn SysML in a three-day class, uh, training class, it is, I think, just wrong. This, this, that is just not my experience. So I've developed an entire curriculum for how to do school acquisition. And so a master's series in this curriculum is a path all the way through to some endpoint. And we have a, a requirements, a curriculum, master's curriculum, and an architecture master's curriculum right now. And there's this plan and more stuff here. The common core, uh, SysML 101, um, basic, you know, all the basic views, but really not in great depth. Uh, and then the 201 gets into more depth and structural stuff, you know, data schemas, a lot more about ports uh, and, and, and flows, and, and a lot about par parametric and building computable, and ex in fact, executing parametric diagrams. And the last is the 202, which is about advanced behavioral modeling, it's just activity diagrams and state machines. And it's a pretty full 3D course. <laughs> Uh, and then we have uh, introduction requirements for parts 101. That, that forms what we call the common core. So, so I want to do just a quick walkthrough of an example. What does it kind of look like? So um, in my, my book, uh, the one that we're giving away today, um, I did this uh, Pegasus Smart Bike Trainer. Uh, I'm an Ironman uh, athlete. Uh, I do Ironman tri triathlons. I do uh, ultra marathon cycling, 24 hour cycles and 500 mile, that sort of thing. Uh, race across the West, 900 miles, 150 miles, uh, that sort of thing. So that, that, that's where I spend my spare time. So, so for the example in this book, I, I created this the Pegasus Smart Trainer Bike. And this shows the package structure. This is a, uh, uh, shows the package structure organization of that model. Um, this uh, shows the sets of requirements and requirements table where we see the different columns. There's a, a name column and a, and a kind of text column with a textual specification. You can also show an ID column and other columns as well. Uh, here's the use case, uh, a use case diagram showing three of the, or four of the capabilities we have modeled as use cases. You know, and emulate the basic gearing, uh, front and rear gearing, uh, measure performance metrics and call resistance. And each one of these then traces to a set of requirements and you build up this computational executable model around that and so on. But you know, this is the, the kind of the basic view uh, and it connects to example to a training app. Uh, there's some standard um, web-based training uh, systems like Sufferfest, Training Road Zwift and others out there that you can connect to. And of course, it interacts with the rider on the bike. And you also have an application to configuration that I can select what your gearing you wanna have available and, and so on. This shows the type context, the context of the system. Here's the system as an element um, with you know, connection points called ports. Uh, we've got our um, interface blocks defined up here. Uh, we've got our actors. Uh, in this case, this is the cameo model. The book actually has the, the models as Rhapsody models. And just for this uh, purpose, I, I created uh, cameo versions of these. Um, I create a block that represents that uh, actor because in Cameo, <clears throat> I can't add an actor to a, uh, or give me a port to an actor. So I basically use a stand-in called an actor block to stand in for that. So I can build up and execute my, my, my context, my system context uh, as, a, as a feature. I can execute and simulate it and uh, do behavioral analysis. Uh, this is a pretty common sort of view that you'll have in, in new model SysML. Uh, we've got the system, and we've got the various kind of sub-assemblies or subsystems, the mechanical frame, powertrain, comms. Uh, this would be um, uh, Bluetooth, uh, ANT, and FEC, other kind of connection modalities. Uh, the right and reaction subsystem, where we have we control gearing. I can change my gearing you know, with uh, an interface. I can visualize the gearing. I can also incline, decline the bike. Um, I have electrical power delivery, and I've got a mean kind of computing platform, which uh, the system actually, as you push on it, uh, you, it'll create resistance uh, using uh, some internal mechanism, such as an electric motor. Um, so you can you know, do, do uh, like rides on simulated terrain where you go up hills, down hills, and, and race and you sprints and all these things on that. And it provides resistance based on, on the terrain and what your, what your profile looks like. 
So this forms a what we call the type composition architecture on a block definition diagram. This shows how does the system all connect up. This is an internal block diagram showing parts. Those are the uh, roles. Uh, a part is, is really a role, an instance of a type plays in a particular context. And these show the parts of the system connected up uh, with connectors to the external ports of the system. So this shows that internal structure. Uh, this is a parametric diagram uh, doing a trade study, looking at different alternatives uh, for selecting uh, how we generate resistance. Whether you want to use a hydraulic system with a variable aperture um, uh, valve, whether you want to do some combination electrical hydraulic, or you do electric motor, you want to use wind turbine, you know, however you want to generate resistance. Uh, what are the alternatives and pros and cons? This allows us to build a computational model to perform that trade study. I use this example interaction for a use case model. Uh, we've got the use case, we've got our, our actors, and we can talk about how they interact over time and represent the, the signal exchange between the writer as he moves the pedals around and we compute uh, resistance and, and do computation of inertia and, and so on to do the math to determine how much resistance should be applied at the point of the pedal. Uh, there's the flow of control behavior. This is for the, uh, uh, the computation of the, of the bicycle physics uh, and execution. So this is a, again, executes via token ex uh, execution semantics. And these are different actions that are performed as we, as we basically do the math and we go back and do some more math. Over time. This is a, a loop that goes on as we're running the system to continuously update the resistance depending upon what the writer's doing as well as what the train looks like. A uh, very simple state machine uh, for part of the system that talks about how to emulate gearings. Again, for use case, um, how, do we, how do I emulate gearings? Everything on here represents a requirement in some sense because it's a, it's a specification state machine rather than, than a design state machine. So you want to know more information. This is, again, I realize it's kind of a fire hose, brief uh, conversation. If you don't know more, I, I, you can feel free to come on down to my website. Uh, it's, it's all free. You have papers and presentations and forums and stuff. Uh, as I mentioned, I've written the occasional book. Uh, with that, I'll uh, throw control back over to, uh, to Jack or to Dan. Thanks, Bruce. Um, so I think uh, our winner for the book today is Carolyn Booth. Um, so, uh, Carolyn, we have your email information. We will send you an email and uh, get your mailing address and, uh, you know, let us know which of uh, Bruce's books you'd like. We'll get you an autographed copy of, uh, of his book. Thank you very much for, for attending. Um, we're a little bit over on time, but uh, since this is being recorded, how about we go ahead and get to some questions? And... Um, let me get to the first one here. So uh, can you elaborate on the architecture framework, how they relate to SysML? Is it just another way to show diagrams using SysML language when it relates to MBSE? Okay, so the architecture frameworks uh, provide not, uh, practices, which are process fragments, right, workflows, as well as a semantic basis representing systems. So if you, at the ones I've talked about, you know, uh, UPDM, um, UAF, and so on, those are based on SysML underlying semantics. So it's what we call domain-specific language, DSL. So we take the underlying language as the, as the basis and then say, we have a special kind of that. So we have, for example, UAF, you have the notion of resource. Well, it's really a kind of block. Right, <laughs> so that's really kind of block. But in the domain of discourse, in this case, you know, um, the architecture framework, we want to talk about resource versus systems versus capability. Those are different concepts, and we want to relate those concepts from the domain and represent them using uh, SysML as an underlying uh, language architecture. So the really main specific language based on SysML. As, as, a, as, a, as a repetitional format, uh, along with adding some, some, some practices and use the framework for those kinds of systems. 
Good yep. question. So if you were using um, UPDM, would it be okay to express your elements as blocks or should you use the resource to represent your elements? I think that's a great question. And the answer is, it's up to you. In my, in my experience, most people who want to use DoDAF, get DoDAF work products, and I do a lot of that, um, use SysML directly. They don't use it in UPDM. It is more common, in my experience, to use SysML as a language. However, there's an option. If instead you'd rather use UPDM, it is a more specialized, also more complex, language for expressing those DoDAF products where uses the DoDAF vocabulary under the covers, it's still SysML, you just do that vocabulary. So in my experience, most people use SysML for that purpose, but it's okay to use UPDM. It's specialized for, it's expressly for that purpose. Okay, thank you. Okay, thanks. Uh, John has a question. What if any future improvements to SysML are being discussed? Oh my God, that's a big topic. Um, this is a great one to hand off to Sandy. Um, and the answer is kind of yes. Uh, um, there's a, they, they want to maintain some backward compatibility of the SysML language itself because it, what it does, it actually does pretty well. There are places where they want to clarify things to make them align better. But in addition to the language itself, they also want to tie in tools and tool APIs into that as well. Uh, that's something that's not at all addressed by the current standard. So that's a, that's a, a new area. As that expresses. So not only are there, you know, one could argue defect repair or you know, additional specializations for system engineering work products themselves, but they're also addressing some new areas of, 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 um, of subject, so such, as, such as, as, as I mentioned, um, tools, tool compliance, and, uh, and tool APIs. That's a big topic. Thanks, Bruce. Um, Andrew has a question. To what extent does this curriculum prepare students for OCSMP certification? Um, and this was whenever you were going through your curriculum slide on SISMA 101, 102. Yeah. Um, I would say it doesn't really address that concern. I, I, I wasn't really, I didn't base the curriculum based on this is the test you have to pass. Rather, I base the curriculum on your engineers, this is what you have to be able to do. This is the capability you as an engineer must bring to the table. And so because of that, I didn't focus it on passing the test. So it's really meant for, it's, meant, it's not really meant for certification. If you wanted to get certificated, if that's your, if that's your purpose, there are people who have classes out there to prepare you for certification, but that's a different task than enabling you to be a better engineer or use these Indian engineering way better. Thanks, Chris. Terry, Terry has a question. Um, what are the pros and cons between SysML and UML uh, function flow block diagrams and its derivatives and object processing language? I don't know object processing language. I can't speak to that. Uh, UML uh, is the language I use preferentially when I'm doing MDD, model driven development. Uh, and again, my, my world is embedded systems, but you can use it for general um, software development. And system and SysML is what I use preferentially for systems engineering work. Uh, so I say that's kind of the difference is where is, is the uh, is kind of the target. Uh, sometimes I'll mix a mix mix project where you do the systems part in SysML and you hand it downstream to people who use UML. At that point, they basically throw off the covers and they uh, expose the fact that it's really UML and the covers. So I hope that answers your question. Okay, um, got another one from Bill. Uh, can you discuss what is a SysML stereotype and when to use them when you want to create a new stereotype? Uh, stereotypes are a way, so remember M0 and M1, right? Uh, M0 instance model, M1 is the uh, our blueprint model, you know, the user model, and then M2, your UML language. So stereotypes basically exist at level M15, 
um, they're a lightweight way to extend your modeling language. So you might, for example, I use would be, uh, I've got an operation, but I want to add metadata around the operation because I want to, in a real time environment, understand what's the average execution time, worst case execution time, what's the deadline, uh, and, and uh, the jitter around that execution. I want to capture that real time information uh, around performance so I can do you know, a performance analysis. So one way to do that is say, well, this is a special kind of operation called a real-time operation. And I add those uh, in my stereotype as, as basically attributes of my stereotype, they become tags or tag values for the element. So it's a way of extending information represented by an element, a way of extending your modeling language. And so you would use it whenever you want to extend your modeling language. Uh, I think it's an overused thing. Usually most of the time when people do metamodeling, they should really be doing modeling. That is, you, you rather than say, you know, um, I've got a stereotype for electric engine, uh, and it, and it uh, is a special kind of stereotype over an engine. That really should be a, a, an M1 thing. You've got an engine subclass to another electric engine. This usually you should generally be doing modeling rather than meta modeling. But stereotypes are a defined way that you can extend your modeling language. SysML is, in fact, extended UML by taking UML elements and stereotyping them to create a new modeling language for system engineering. Okay, thanks. Yeah, that's the short answer. <laughs> um, how does a SysML model translate into or integrate with an assembly model in a PDM system? A new wants to know. Well, remember that, that the, the example I gave you the Pegasus model? Where we had this, this um, whoops, let's go back to here. Uh, this can think of this as like a parts list in some sense. So from a type composition model, you could in principle say, well, these are going to be my primary, you know, LRUs or, or pieces, components I have to create and manage my PLM system. You could have that kind of connection to PLM system if you wanted to. So that's kind of how I think it's a PLM is typically uh, identifying the structural elements you're going to construct, and then you have the uh, it's my list of my, uh, my my pieces, my inventory, and how do I assemble them? And how do I assemble them is then you know shown by this connected architecture. This is how they get assembled and how they get connected up. So I think there's a pretty strong relationship between those in principle. Okay, thanks. Um, and uh, Esteban has a question. Hello, Bruce. Thank you for the talk. In summary, if possible, in a couple sentences, what does a good model smell like? Ah, it smells like victory. Easy one. Okay. <clears throat> okay. Um, good, good deal. Okay. Um, let me say, okay, let me elaborate that a little bit. Um, it smells like it is, hello, probably you've got well-defined purpose and scope, a defined local precision necessary to achieve your objectives, and it executes and is verifiable. Okay, um, Jamie just popped up a question. Could you please share your perspective about the state of the art and MBSE integration and data interop interoperability, most promising technologies? Okay, so, um, so for interoperability, there's a standard called FMI. So we talk about federation of models. There's a standard called FMI, the Functional Mockup Interface, which is specifically targeted towards building hybrid simulation models. So for example, the CRYSTAL program done uh, a few years ago now, where you have you know, uh, a structural model that's done in, uh, I forget it's UML or system, I think it was UML, um, defining structure and state machine behavior. Uh, you have a control loop uh, done in Simulink. You've got simulation X or, oh, this one was Medellica. Medellica uh, doing like environmental and weather models and so on for, for aircraft de-icing system. So is there a standard way in which we can federate such models for the purpose of simulation and analysis. And so, yes, there are ways to do that. A different answer to the question would be around sharing models between tool environments. Uh, that's problematic, I have to say. Um, so there is a standard called XMI, which is the uh, XML model interchange standard. Uh, and it's frankly lossy. Um, interesting story about that. Uh, all of the tools uh, of which I'm aware uh, share 
um, an implementation created by, by Sodius, a uh, French company uh, that creates the some interchange tools. And yet, uh, if you go between Cameo and Rhapsody or the other tools, uh, there is information loss. It's not a lot necessarily, typically it's around diagram forms, but there's some information loss that you have to, stuff that you have to redo. So anywhere from 90% gets exchanged. Uh, they have released a, a new tool recently called Publisher, which specifically addresses moving from Rhapsody to Cameo. And it does a, a better job than the standard import. Still not 100%. So yeah, I, I'd say it's a bit problematic, the, uh, the exchange of models between, between different tools. And uh, yeah, it's a shame. Okay. I think that's the end of the question that I saw, Jack. Any uh, questions from, um, that were submitted before? Before we started, yep, I saw Jack come off, but I don't hear him. Maybe we lost him. Um, we're way over on time, anyways. So thanks a lot, everybody, for attending. Bruce, thank you for your time and giving a giving a great talk. And um, stay tuned, October 6th, we'll give the next one on Agile and BSE. So thanks for attending, everybody. Have a good day.